subtraction. Uh, however, this subtraction is only works only at one level at the leading uh, co correction. Uh, then one had to imagine what to do to next order. And uh, uh, then one thought about some techniques which had been used in Condon's letter, which was to introduce effective parameters to replace initial microscopic parameters in situation where the interaction was strong. And uh, using this idea, uh, which now we call renormalization, uh, then uh, uh, it was possible uh, to uh, devise a strategy to do it to all orders. Uh, and uh, this was concluded by the and by Dyson after the work of uh, Feynman, Schoenier, and uh, He was able to put two all orders at uh, this technique of replacing so-called bare parameters, initial parameters of Lagrangian, by renormalized parameters. Uh, uh, led to uh, general cancellation of divergences. In my indictment is one of the stars also which gets a Nobel Prize and uh, contribution is essential in this case. So you see not everybody. Okay, I'm not going to explain your renormalization, most of you know of this, but the essential point which was discovered that is that, uh, let's say in a series where they only put an electron to say fine. Uh, what you do is that you calculate the, the real, the physical, you start explaining in terms of the charge, the charge you see in the Lagrangian, you put some cutoff, which breaks uh, some fundamental theory, but you say when the cutoff becomes infinite, uh, I don't care. And uh, you calculate the, the physical charge, the one you measure in experiment at large reason, the physical mass, which is the one you measure, changed by the interaction. And then you invert this relation, you express everything in terms of so-called physical quantities, and then you discover that if you do that, and if you norm renormalize the parts, normalize properties of fields, then everything is fine. Okay, that's a clear implementation. And now, of course, uh, then it was proven with more and more rigor and all uh, these things, but uh, the point is that it, of course, worked beautifully with that. And it really is the best test that has tested theory there. Okay, so that, uh, was established from the point of view of uh, real physics. Uh, however, uh, uh, it was uh, something quite surprising because it was difficult to, to figure out why. Uh, anyway, uh, the, one of the consequences was immediately that the normalization procedure works only for a limited class of field theories, those which are, have some properties in terms of degree of polynomials. And uh, this constrains very much the structure of any possible bond of field theory. And this was a basic principle to build new bonds which would incorporate weak and strong interactions. And without this idea of renormalization, the, this, the world of bond of field theory would have been too large and expensive, while it reduced to a small number of theories. Okay, so the, the conclusion was that the uh, renormal theory was obviously in my theory because it affects the experiment and in physics that's the only thing that really matters and if you don't care about proof and stuff like that, that's only fine at the end of the day if you want to discover. However, uh, some theories, quantum field theories mainly, I mean, uh, still were puzzled and they want to understand why. So there were several proposals. Uh, it's a disease uh, of mathematics. You are not doing by perturbation theory is mathematics. You have uh, not well defined, and if you change it mathematically, maybe it works. Uh, uh, the, the scheme which was the most uh, popular in the 60s and in the 70s, start of the 70s was that quantum field theory was only defined by renormalized perturbation theory. Okay, so so it means that you don't you think that uh, the, the Lagrangian, Hamiltonian, uh, with from divergent coefficients, cut off defined coefficient, it was just uh, not uh, physically acceptable. It was physically meaningless. And uh, the Lagrangian was just a way to tell you the, the rules of Feynman diagrams. Okay, and then uh, <coughs> the, the real object is renormalization. <coughs> okay. This was very drastic, of course, because then you. You didn't know why uh, Lagrangian and Hamilton were important in quantum, non relativistic quantum mechanics, or even in non relativistic world, or in the non quantum world, and suddenly we disappeared again. Okay, and uh, the other point of view was the cutoff was physical, 
uh, and it was provided by some other theory interactions like the strong interaction, for instance. Uh, however, then uh, you are facing another problem is that uh, uh, why was this mechanism of cancellation of impunities? What did it mean? That meant that uh, physics was in some sense short distance insensitive, but you, you, you did not really understand why. Okay. Nevertheless, this is a point of view which is the closest to the modern thinking, except that uh, we don't believe anymore that the cutoff provides by strong interactions in the standard model incorporates strong interactions. And uh, it will not be given by any other point of view that you can imagine. So it may come from strong theories. That cannot be of the form of the point of view. Okay. Now, in, in the, in the mid-50s, uh, it was a discover doing the same mistake that oh, I think I'm pushing on the wrong button. I'm doing something wrong. I think it's a manipulation of this thing, but I'm doing something wrong. Oh, okay. So I'm pushing something wrong, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, okay, for you. Yeah. They are too sophisticated. Okay, so uh, it, there was something, uh, some kind of formal property which was discovered by several groups, uh, Peter Mann, Schneckenberg, with a male's derivative. But really, the people who do it understood that as Gaiman and Joe and probably Russian. Okay. So they considered QED with massless electrons because they thought about high energy forces. Okay, and uh, now if you have, if the electron is massless, no, normally you define the charge by, let's say, the interaction between two electrons at large distance, okay, like the Coulomb law, whatever. Yeah, that's the way it is. However, if the electron is massless, then it propagates the speed of light, and therefore you cannot define the renormalized charge in terms of uh, static electrons. Okay, so you have to define in terms of physical process, uh, and uh, yeah, which characterize the strengths of the electron magnetic interaction. And uh, then you have to decide at what uh, scale or what this scale of distance or momentum or energy uh, you want to define it. Okay. So you have to introduce some arbitrary mass scale or some scale, and you define the renormalized charge as the strength of the electronic interaction at this scale. Okay. And this, this quantity you call effective charge at scale S. However, since uh, uh, it's your option to define uh, this at some scale, you can define another scale, you can call it S prime, and then you call it E prime, it's a charge at another scale. And then you realize immediately that uh, if you want the physics to be kept fixed, then there must be relations between, given S and S prime, there must be a relation between E and E prime because it's kind of the same physics. And this was called renormalization. Uh, now, after that, it's not too difficult to realize that uh, uh, if you make an infinitesimal scale transformation, uh, then uh, the variation of the effective charge, or let's say here uh, I have five metallic clamps of alpha, the band structure constant, satisfies a uh, differential equation, uh, a flow equation, in terms of some function, which uh, much later was called the beta function by Kurt Zemanczyk. Uh, and uh, which you can calculate in observations. Okay, and then you also, it was realized uh, in the 70s, beginning of the, I mean the late 60s, that in fact you can do it even in matter theory. You can decide that the, it's not natural, but you can decide to define the charge as interaction at the scale of the z-vector boson uh, at uh, 100 GeV, if uh, you would like. Okay. Provide, uh, I mean, for instance, particular to address in high energy, just choose uh, high energy scale. Okay, so now the physical and the physics interpretation is, is simple. Okay, at uh, large distance, uh, the strength of the electromagnetic interaction is a constant. It doesn't depend on the scale. Okay, and you can measure it by the Coulomb force. At least uh, that's the way we can think about it. However, once you start uh, exploring distances which are much smaller than wavelengths associated with particles, since you're exploring inside of particles, uh, 
then you see some screening effect, which comes from the fact that the quantum vacuum in quantum fields is something which is not neutral. You can think about the quantum vacuum as being a superposition of uh, electron positron pairs, uh, arbitrary number, and uh, virtually a uh, superposition. And therefore, uh, due to the screening effect, short distance, uh, the charge should increase at shorter distance. And but what is fascinating is that this change is related to renormalization. That's what is fascinating. It says that there is a screening effect, you say, well, there's a property of quantum vacuum, but uh, in addition, it's related to renormalization, which is not uh, completely obvious. Now, in the case of k mine law, their hope was to calculate the, the notion of, of the, the flow of the bare charge to see whether it would have a finite limit when uh, at, high, at short distance. However, this doesn't work because the uh, First coefficient of the beta function is possibly, and therefore the effective charge increases at short distance, and the perturbation here is no longer acceptable. And uh, the, the other point at the time, which we defined, is the remark of Landau and Tomer And uh, they did what they did is to sum the, make a leading log summation of the high energy contribution to electron propagator, and uh, they did show that there was an empirical pole. And physical means that uh, it's a particle which has a negative metric, uh, which was of the exponent form exponential one of a beta two with the first coefficient of the beta function uh, times alpha. Uh, and uh, for, for Landau's, this was a sign that two is inconsistent and therefore should be rejected. Some way, okay. And uh, except that uh, you realize that these numbers tend to sub tend to the sort of GED, and therefore nobody has ever really uh, impressed by a singularity which is uh, large, uh, as a mass which is large than the Planck scale. And also then Bobby Shirkov noticed that this uh, amount to solve renormalization group flow equation for alpha small and use it for alpha large. Uh, but I think that this point is mathematically correct. Nevertheless, the uh, Lando argument is what we believe to be true, that indeed QED is inconsistent but uh, it's inconsistent at a scale which is not uh, a physical obstacle, really, because it's far beyond what we need. Okay. Now, uh, to me, after that, uh, the principle that the quantum fields should be renormalized, as I said, uh, allowed to limit the number of quantum fields that to be considered uh, to extend uh, the model to weak and strong interactions. And uh, uh, it was realized that the, main, the best candidate is non aggregate theories. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition, uh, I mean, for weak interaction, this was a whole story of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in, in non aggregate theories, which was a problem itself. And the, the, the problem there was to give a mass to the vector particle for weak interaction because it seemed to be almost local interactions. And in the strong sector, which uh, for some time was a puzzle, the fact that uh, when it was discovered plus the experiments that uh, the interaction between uh, some fundamental, more fundamental objects, which are quark and gluon nowadays, uh, uh, could not be understood. And then the beta function was calculated and was understood that strong force had anti squaring properties. Okay. So that after that, we, by 1933, essentially, uh, the standard model was constructed to minor modifications. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, the next, uh, at this point, you see that the reform was to, uh, to incorporate gravity. And gravitation is a framework of renormalizable quantum fields. It is also supposed to be the ultimate theory of everything. And uh, this program essentially failed and uh, led the people to go back, to go over to uh, something completely different. Now, uh, let me just change topic, and sure, I will not spend too much time on it, but it's important because uh, otherwise the story would stop more or less where I stopped just a few seconds ago. And so on the other, I, the, on the other planet, some other theories who didn't communicate much with the previous one uh, were interested in second order phase transition. and. Uh, what is the second or phase transition for system with short run interactions? The prototype is an uh, easy model where you have spin on the lattice and then track by your state of traction. 
And uh, the point was that there was bizarre pop when you approach a critical temperature uh, in this system. Uh, that's the nature of continuous or standard phase transition. Uh, and if you measure correlation between spins at large distance, you see that, and you define the length associated with the correlation between spins, then you discover that uh, at large, there is large distance correlation. Correlation lengths become very large, near the, and even diverges at the critical temperature. So that, uh, uh, so it means that uh, in a system which initially the only length is, let's say, the lattice, in the case of the heating model, it's one, one. You create, you generate dynamically a length which is much larger than the microscopic length. And in addition, at the scale of the correlation length, you find some macroscopic physics which is non-trivial. Okay. Now, uh, this was known, of course, for a very long time. And uh, then uh, you said, well, that's, that's easy enough. Uh, phase transition is a macroscopic phenomenon. I mean, you see it observed by your bare eyes. And uh, therefore, there should be a, a negative theory at the scale of uh, your laboratory or your experiment. And uh, you don't have to know much about microscopic physics or the initial Hamiltonian. You just can describe it by some effective parameter in the same way that I can describe uh, this table, the property of this table, without knowing that it's composed with atoms or crystals or whatever. It's just a piece of wood uh, which has some density, some size, etc. Then you don't have to. There are some parameters coming from microscopy physics, but uh, you can take that into parameters and you don't know how to, you don't have to think about it. Now, if you do that, it's very simple. I mean, if you think about it, it's not enough. That's called mean field theory, and uh, in general, it was known in the beginning of the 20th century for some system and then arrived completely by Lando, and I said, okay, so Lando theory of critical phenomena. And, uh, uh, such a theory, uh, I, I like to call it quasi Gaussian or quantitative Gaussian because it's very much related to the central limited theorem of probabilities. And uh, mean field theory is a beautiful theory because it's beautifully simple and it makes so called universal predictions. Uh, for instance, for anti-chromatic systems, irrelevant or except, I mean, without uh, reference to the number of dimensions of space which is uh, maybe a theoretical concept or symmetries of the system. It's just a uh, magnetization bench is like a square root of Tc minus T, correlation length diverged by one of the square root of T minus Tc, and so on. The number of universal properties which are true for any dimension of space or any symmetry and only any microscopic dynamics. Which is okay, as I said, I mean, it's clear that you can construct tables with different kinds of movements like that, and you feel a table which as a good character by some density. Okay, so that's what we expect. Uh, now, of course, uh, once people start doing experiment or lattice model calculations, they, they start seeing some disagreement with mean field theory, and then there was uh, also the shock of the exact solution of these in two dimensions using my guy on one year, and of four, which found critical exponents, which characterize this kind of uh, singular behavior, which were clearly in disagreement. Uh, and then people started wondering whether well, it's not special and like that. Okay. Now, uh, furthermore, if, if you try to calculate correction to mean field theory, and this was done many later, uh, then, so remarkably enough, you find when the correlation at the critical temperature, where the correlation length is infinite, you find infinities. For any dimension of space, small or equal to four. Like uh, infinities of quantum. Okay. Uh, now, if you, if you go further by numerical investigation and also you compare different systems, you, uh, you compare the liquid rate of ice transition in uh, uh, CO2, in water, and things like that, uh, while well, you get the feeling that uh, there is some kind of universality which survives, but it is no longer true for any dimension, for example, it's more limited to what nowadays we call university classes. Okay. So there are a group of theories which have the same property. But uh, different groups have different properties of their several universal class. When in mean field theory, there is only one universal class. So, this uh, I will spend two minutes on that because it's very important, and, uh, even though it's uh, somewhat trivial. Okay, so the, I want to remind you that uh, one of the fundamental paradigms of 
physics, SB, and the two large spans remains, the decoupling of scales, which means that physics phenomena corresponding to very different scale, physics scale, uh, just decouple. Okay, which means you can discuss one without reference to the other one. And uh, that's, uh, uh, this we know, we, we learned already in high school, at least, uh, I believe. Uh, at least I learned it in last year of high school. First year of university, I don't know. Okay, that the first, you know, it's buried under the name dimensional analysis. Now, under this name, it's kind of funny because you think it's a mechanical process. Okay, so then then you, uh, you see, uh, I'm very smart. Uh, even making any theoretical argument, I know that uh, the period of the pendulum uh, we can only depend on the length of the pendulum, its mass, and the gravitation constant, the uh, acceleration of uh, gravity, uh, in the place where I'm living. And uh, there's only one time you can make, which is square root of L of G, and therefore up to a number, which you don't need to calculate by theory, but you know the law of the pendulum. Okay. Now, uh, if you are somebody who is uh, more inclined to, 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 to look to difficulties, then after some time you realize that uh, you have been solved an argument which is too easy. In reality, what this argument is about is telling you that uh, everything which is much smaller than the scale of the length of your pendulum, or much larger, is not to be taken into account, at least to a very good approximation. Yeah, because in fact your pendulum is constructed with some atoms, yeah, so there's at least a scale, atomic scale is buried in it, presumably there may be intermediate scales. In addition, uh, it is sitting in a room of the Earth, which has some radius, uh, and so on and so forth, and uh, therefore it's not true that it's only one length, and therefore it could be anything. Okay? So in fact what has been sold to you without, at least if you have not a very good physics professor, and, uh, is uh, he has forgotten to tell you that uh, in fact we believe uh, and we assume that it is uh, absolutely uh, normal that uh, different lengths can couple and therefore you don't have to care about that. Uh, and uh, in the same way, uh, when, you, when we calculate the orbits of planets using Newton's law, uh, we can replace planets and sun by point like objects. We can neglect the other stars of the galaxy and still we get the same answer. Okay? And therefore, it means that uh, the next star is too far and uh, the size of the field of the sun is too small to be counted. And so, oh, so, the, so the question, and this is what you are told a little bit later, you say a very good physicist is the one who is identifying the element, the group of freedom, and the parameters which are associated to the scale of the element you want to describe. And most of the time, it is true. And fortunately, because otherwise it would have stopped theoretical progress in physics for several centuries. So it's essential to believe in that at, at some point. Otherwise, uh, it means that physics, the other hypothesis is that physics is sensitive to all scales. And therefore, you need to know all the laws of nature before doing to do any prediction. And this uh, makes theoretical physics impossible, so it's the only experiment in physics. Okay. Now, this, uh, there was no contradiction. Even though it was not, presumably not fully understood, why this should be so, okay? Nevertheless, uh, it seems to be a law of nature, and uh, until the 20th century, uh, nobody would question this, this point of view. And even in the 20th century, most of people would not question it either. Okay? Now, uh, there have been two domains of physics where this has been challenged, which is not true, which is the theory of fundamental microscopic interaction, which is one of these theory, and the theory of continuous phase transition. And in both situations, the infinite number of strongly coupled microscopic geometry cannot be replaced in general by a small number of peptic microscopic geometry. Because if you do that, you get wrong answers. You get infinities in fact. Okay, which means infinities now is an indication that for something at short scale has to be taken into account. Which you wanted to omit, and that, that's not wrong. And uh, to explain, the, now, nevertheless, uh, we observe that. Uh, uh, <coughs> renormalization procedure works for quantum field theory. So in some sense, even though you have to introduce a cutoff, it is somewhat short distance insensitive. And you, you don't have to specify. You can take different kind of cutoff and you get the same answer. And uh, in the same way, uh, empirically, uh, in the, in the sees in experiments and in body calculation, that in the second order phase transition, uh, few 
properties of system matter, and so microscopic Hamilton cannot be totally forgotten, but the detail of it are not important. And to understand this paradox, because it really looks like a paradox, we know they should go very well. So, and uh, so first, we know the truth ha has allowed us to understand this. And second, the consequence is that the relation group has provided a range of quite of renowned quantity as effective largest in theories, which means temporary theories. Okay, I don't want to go into this, okay, because for lack of time, because it's later, but uh, you understand, I mean, just to refer to Canada and Wilson again. That uh, they had a picture about the normalization group as uh, starting with the lattice Hamiltonian group in a lattice point. Okay. So the idea, initial idea of the normalization group as you work uh, in Canada of 1968, which is very different from the quantum kilo renormalization group, is you start from a lattice model uh, with some Hamiltonian, and you have some, let's say, local nearest neighbor interaction. And then what you do is that you sum on the spins, the initial spins by fixing the average value, or let's say, of the square beyond this lattice. So after that, you have a new Hamiltonian, which corresponds to a scale, a double scale, and which new spins, which are average of spins. Okay, and then you iterate this transformation. Okay, and uh, in this way, you construct a renormalization group. This is what they would call a renormalization group, which means an effective Hamiltonian with spins on a double scale. And eventually of the scale to, to the end the initial scale. And if when the number of iteration becomes large, you flow to a Hamilton, a fixed Hamilton, a fixed point of this transformation, then you understand by existence of attractive fixed point that we know this renormalization group, which looks very different, as I said, from the quantum renormalization group, you understand the universality classes because you understand that slowly this uh, process is filtering. It's a filtering process where only a few properties survive, and the rest essentially is integrated out, even when scales do not become mm -hmm. Now, not moreover, and this is more specific Wilson contribution, he realized that uh, if this process makes sense, then even if you start from a lattice Hamiltonian with spin taking only two values, if you iterate enough, Eventually, you can replace the lattice by continuous space because the lattice size will shrink to zero. And uh, again, if you average even a discrete variable at many times, so you can replace by continuous value. And therefore, if there is a fixed point Hamiltonian, it should be of the nature of a quantum field theory. I call it a local statistical field theory because it is in imaginary time. It's not, uh, not real time. Okay, so it's a, the Hamiltonian is a real weight. Okay? And uh, it's a real partition function. And local, because initially there were only short range interactions. And so if you make iteration, it will remain local. And eventually, you look at quantum field theory. And this was uh, the absolute breakthrough. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, the story is uh, easy enough. Okay. Uh, once you realize this, then you realize that uh, uh, there is a fixed point, uh, uh, which is a massless quantum field theory. Or scale of field, is that this is a fixed point of a renormalization group, and it corresponds to a uh, mean field theory. It's called the Gaussian fixed point. Okay. And then uh, you can discuss the stability of the gauge fiction to perturb local perturbation. You discover that uh, for dimension large than four, there is no perturbs, it's stable. And for dimension small or equal to four, it is unstable due to the, I mean, potentially unstable when you add the integral to df pi to the 4, which is a leading contribution to stability. And uh, therefore, in the neighborhood of dimension 4, below dimension 4, you can describe critical phenomena by uh, renormalizing the quantum field theory. And what is absolutely amazing, and even now, you know, 30, 40 years later, I'm still amazed, if you start from a model where there is no quantum field theory, with concept which seems to be completely orthogonal to quantum field theory, and at the end of the day, you find the renormalizable quantum field theory. And it is generated. It is not built in because you decided that it should be there. However, one difference is that it has a natural cutoff. Because it started with, there was no divergence initially. And uh, the, the, the cutoff means that there is a microscopic length in this problem. Okay? There was a lattice space in So it has a cutoff. 